If you're hearing my voice now, I am in prison, but I hope to be released by 7 or 7.15 this evening. I am Father Daniel Maxwell. I am the pastor of Our Lady of Angels, and I am a priest. A pastor is my job. A pastor is the head of a parish, and a priest is what I am. So uh, what called me to the priesthood? Well, it's a very long story, and I won't... Uh, I won't go on at great length, but let's just say since I was a young boy, I always felt an attraction to God and specifically to the Catholic Church. My family wasn't Catholic uh, when I was young. And so I felt an attraction, and as I grew older and I began to look at different churches, I felt totally drawn to the church that Jesus Christ himself founded, which is the Catholic Church. And shortly thereafter, I began feeling a very strong call uh, to become a priest. Now, I plan to have a, a wife and kids and a normal family, but and that's a beautiful thing. But I chose this, and I am not regretting it in any way. It was God's calling me, and I feel secure that he has called me to be a priest. Now, uh, to, in order to be a priest, um, you have to have uh, you have to go through seminary, which is a, a school specifically for the training of priests. You have four years of college with a major in philosophy, and then you have four years of graduate work with a major in theology. So you end up with a Master of Divinity or a Master of Theology. I have a Master of Divinity uh, from Mount Angel Seminary, which is near Salem. Now, that can take eight years. I'd had some junior college before I went into seminary, so it, it took me seven years. But I also took a few years away. You see, when you go to seminary, you have those eight years, and only in the last year do you have to finally decide, yes, I want to be a priest. That's when they ordain you a deacon. So many marriages, often the, the man and the woman meet and they've only met each other for one or two years before they get married. Marriage, of course, lasts for life until one of them dies. The priesthood lasts after you die. When you die in heaven, or God forbid in hell, you're a priest. You're a priest forever. Now, one of the most difficult changes in my life is that I'm no longer a private person. I, I, I live in a rectory rather than my own house. Um, I do own things. We're not uh, those kind of monks that do not own anything. Uh, but... I'm in the public. People know where I live. Uh, I get called uh, this past Sunday night. I got called to go down to the hospital to anoint somebody who was very seriously ill. And that's part of the job. And I'm happy to do it. I do take one day off every week. That's Monday. And I usually, because I love to drive, I like to go out and, and um, uh, relax for a bit. But one of my favorite parts, I think, of being a priest is being able to say Mass and hear confessions. Now, when I hear a confession, I, I don't remember what people tell me, the sins that they tell me. Uh, most of them are pretty much the same things. But what I do enjoy is seeing somebody become unburdened, seeing Jesus take those sins off of their soul, forgiving them from those sins, and they walk out a free man or a free woman. I've had confessions that were... 40 and 50 years since their last confession. And to see those people leave in, in joy, just absolutely filled with grace that their sins have been forgiven, to me that gives me great joy. I take joy when I baptize a little baby, or for that matter, when I baptize an adult, and know that they are now a son or daughter of God. When I say Mass, when I take a piece of bread and a cup of wine, and I consecrate them, and by the grace of God, they stop being bread and wine and they become Jesus' body and blood. That gives me joy. When I can go to a sick person who is dying at the hospital or at their house, and I can give them the anointing, and I can ab absolve them of their sins and help them get to heaven, that gives me joy. Now, the average day for a diocesan priest, uh, Tuesday through Sunday, we'll say Tuesday through Friday, I come down to the office I have Mass at 8 o'clock in the morning, most mornings. Father Arturo shares those with me, so if he does one, I do the other. Otherwise, we have one at, uh, um, in the evening at Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Um, I come into the office, and usually uh, I have one or two appointments in the morning, one or two in the afternoon. 
These appointments are with people, maybe they want to go to confession, maybe they want to talk about marriage problems, maybe they want to get married, maybe they're having problems of another sort. And so I, I try and, and help them as best as I can. Um, some evenings we have mass or we have a meeting, such as the Knights of Columbus um, in the parish hall. Uh, once a week I say mass up at the prison, which is where I am now. And uh, we have maybe 20 or 30 men that go to the mass in the prison. I do it in Spanish and in English. And uh, we have many men who have turned their lives around because of the Holy Mass. One of the questions that was asked is, what if I changed my mind about being a priest, if I wanted to leave the priesthood? Well, that can be done. It's very difficult. And I believe that God called me to this. And because of that, I would never leave it. I would never leave the priesthood. Um, as much as I find marriage a beautiful thing, uh, having a wife and having children and helping her get to heaven is, is such a beautiful vocation. And most of you are called to that. But some of you are called to the priesthood. Some of you also may be called to be a religious brother or sister living in a religious community like our sisters. So you all need to ask the Lord every day, what is my vocation? What are you calling me to do? One of the questions is, why don't priests marry? Well, in the Eastern part of the Catholic Church, some priests are married. But the reason that we don't in the West, for one thing, is that I'm married to the church. And if I'm also married to a woman, I want to give my whole life to helping her get to heaven. But if I had, let's say, two wives, how could I give 100% of myself to both of them? If I have a parish, like I do, how can I give myself totally to my parish and also totally to my wife? I'd have to be divided. And so it would not be fair to my wife if I were married and also a priest. Now I realize that many other religions have married priests. But another reason is that a priest stands in the physical place of Christ. And Christ was a man. If Mary had been our high priest instead of Jesus, then all our priests would be women. But the priest stands for Christ. So that's why we have male priests. But we have women, religious, nuns and sisters like Mother Teresa, like Sister Rocio and Sister Maria, women who have given their life to serve the Lord, not as priests, but in other ways, to pray, to teach, as our sisters do. Some of them are nurses, some of them are, are um, scientists. Uh, and it's the same of, of, with religious brothers, orders of men. There's all different vocations that the Lord may be calling you to. And if you find yourself thinking about it on a regular basis, especially you young men, should I be a priest? Should I even think about it? What are my friends going to say? What are my family going to say? Don't worry about that. God will take care of it if that's his will. And like I said, you, if, if you are even accepted to the priesthood, you have eight full years before you have to sign the papers. You can leave at any time. But if the Lord is truly calling you, and he's giving you all the gifts that you need. And they're not going to be exactly like me. In fact, I hope any of you who are called to the priesthood will do better than me. Maybe you'll be the pastor of this parish someday. You'll outdo me. That's a challenge. But I think the most intelligent thing you can do, every single one of you, is to spend a few minutes in prayer every night saying, Lord, what is your vocation to me? What do you want me to do with my life? Like I said, the vast majority of you will be getting married and having families. And please don't have families until you're married because only through the sacrament of matrimony do you have the grace of the sacrament to protect you. The most miraculous thing I ever witnessed, and that's the last uh, question I have, um, it's hard to say. There are many things. I once <clears throat> baptized a 94-year-old woman who was on her deathbed and had wanted to be baptized but was no longer able to talk and her daughter called me over. I baptized her, confirmed her, anointed her. She died the next day. 94 years of sins wiped away like that. I more recently baptized a woman in a similar situation. She came from Vietnam, a communist country where she could not become a Catholic. And none of her family who lived here were Catholics, but she wanted to be one. And her son, who was a Buddhist, 
called me to give her the sacraments, which she was able to ask for. I've seen a case of the anointing of the sick where a woman uh, in, in another hospital in another town was bleeding to death internally. And I came down and anointed her. And I was a brand new priest back then. And I was really sad. You know, she was about the age my mother would have been. And she was going to die in a few hours, they told me. So a couple days later, I went down to the hospital to anoint another person. And I saw that this first lady's name was still on the roll sheet. And so I, I thought, well, maybe it's the wrong sheet. Maybe it's an old one. No, it had the right day on it. So I went down to the room where it said she was. And here was the woman I anointed, who should have been dead within four or five hours, sitting in her street clothes, waiting for her husband to come get her. And I asked her what happened. She says, well, Father, shortly after you anointed me, the doctor came running in and says, I think I know what the problem is. Would you consent to an exploratory surgery? Well, God worked not only on that woman, but also on that doctor and those other people. And so that has convinced me that these sacraments, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, the Holy Eucharist, all of the sacraments are real. And they work miracles when we open our heart to them and recognize for what they are. They're vessels of God's grace. And so I pray that all of you, will consider a vocation, whether it be a marriage, priesthood, or religious life, but you will also make use of the sacraments. Go to Mass not because you have to, but because you want to be with Jesus. You want to hear his voice, and then you receive him in Holy Communion. God bless you, and I hope to see you all soon.